I've been looking for one of these for about years, I should say. I grew up going to Thrifty Ice Cream. Before it was Rite Aid, it was Thrifty. And uh, I grew up looking at the, the, the guy that would, um, you know, get that ice cream. And I would ask him continually, do you sell those? And they would say, no, they, we don't sell them. We don't sell them. Until recently, they started selling them. And, and um, Pastor Kimo uh, and, and Sister Joss would, would attest to this because they went into Rite Aid one day and, and they saw me storming into Rite Aid because I was looking for one of these. Isn't that true? Like This is like month, maybe about a good seven months ago. I was looking for one because I heard that they were selling them. Did you know that they sell these on eBay for about $100? 75s, they go for anywhere from $60 to $100, depending on how greedy the person is. And so I've been looking for one of these. You can tell I'm an ice cream fan. And we were at Auntie Boleyn and Uncle Zane's house just a few weeks ago, and the girls felt like having some ice cream, so the girls went out, and they, they got some ice cream. They came back, and my daughter, Leah, tells me, Hey, Dad, they had your scooper there. Now, we're getting ready to watch the main event. We're getting ready to watch John Jones. And, and, and I said, hey, I got to go. I got to go. And everybody goes, wait, wait, where are you going? You're going right now. I said, yeah, I got to go. I got to go because they got my scooper there. I got to go get that scooper. So I went and I got the scooper. I came back and, and I acted like I didn't have it. I hid it inside my jacket. And they're wanting, wanting to know, did you get it? Did you get it? I said, no. You guys didn't tell me. You guys didn't. You, you should have called me. You should have picked it up. You should have bought. I would have Venmoed you the money right there and then. And I made them feel all bad. And I made them feel all sad. And then I, and then I said, I'm just playing. I got it right here. I got my scooper. I've been waiting for this. You know, I believe the kingdom of God is, is the very same way. Where it works on anticipation. It operates on preparation. It operates with tenacity and not giving up and always being ready. Come on, somebody. I want to talk to you today about being ready for rain. I'm ready for rain. God is using Moses in this portion of Scripture to speak and to begin to challenge Israel because he's, God is delivering a brand new blueprint to Israel. That blueprint has a different way of living than what Israel has been used to living with. You got to understand that when you read this portion of scripture that Israel has been in bondage for up to four, for, for 430 years in Egypt. They're in bondage. How many of you know that it's hard to change your thinking when you have been used to a certain way of living? It's hard to be, it's hard not to be tough when you have been hurt in your life. It's hard not to worry about money when you have struggled with being poor. It's hard not to have a healthy marriage when you have never seen a picture of a healthy marriage. It's hard to raise kids when you have not had the structure or the family structure to be able to see how it is to raise kids. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It hard to change your thinking when you have been used to living a certain way, especially when it comes down to Israel living in bondage for 430 years. In 430 years, all they know is work, scarcity, lack, fear, pain, abuse, struggle, discouragement, bondage, and hopelessness. Every single day for 430 years, generation after generation, gener family after family, individual after individual, mind after mind, heart after heart. This is all they know. This is all they are about. This is all they see. This is the mindset that they have. It is only about so being so in, in, in this this, this cave in this, this box in this, this, this place where they cannot see anything 
good happening in their lives. So God begins to use Moses. To, he, he uses Moses to take them out of Egypt. But you know that that's not all. When you, when you, you move yourself from one place to the next, something is coming with you. Some baggage is coming with you. Some, some mindsets are being with you. Some, some ways of doing things. Some, some responses. Some reactions. Some things of just the way you are. How many of you have ever said, that's just the way I am? How many of you have ever said that? How many of you have ever said, you know, that's the way dad was, so I'm like this. That's the way mom was. That's the way grandfather was, so that's the way I am. It's hard to change your thinking when you have been used to living a certain way. So God begins to institute a new way. Because they have been used to a monarchy. Do you know what a monarchy is? Good, then I won't explain it. For 430 years, they lived under a monarchy. And now they are moving from a monarchy into a theocracy. They're, in, they're being introduced to a new blueprint, a new system. It's a shift of governmental systems that is taking place right here in this portion of Scripture. So the shift in systems requires a shift in their thinking. It requires a shift in their perspective. It's a shift in their mindset. So God takes Israel on a little journey. How many of you know that just as important as the destination, the journey is just as important. If I'm not ready for my destination, for whatever God has for me in my life, then my character will never be able to sustain me. Never let your desires take you where your character cannot keep you. So God takes Israel through this journey. And I'm just laying a foundation here. I know you guys are looking for the fireworks because I came up here last time and I was fire worked out. But I'm just doing a little teaching here. At the same time that God is taking Israel through this journey, he is purging them of an old system. They really believed in this particular part of their lives that Egypt was better. Think about how crazy that sounds. Bondage was better. Working every single day without any pay was better. Being, being, being uh, in scarcity, being in fear, being in lack, hurting, being discouraged, being hopelessness is better. That, but the word actually says that they were complaining about where they were at, not knowing what God is doing, and they were saying Egypt was better. They had no idea that the wilderness was actually the training ground of a brand new system. Come on, say, God, influence me. Introduce me to the new system. first point that I want to make is there is a better way. There is a better way. What most people do not understand is that they are living in a system that either is not allowing them to progress or they're just completely living in survival mode. Religion is a system. It only allows you to believe so much. It only allows you to progress so far. There are certain things, certain rules, certain codes, certain, certain things that if you don't match up, then you don't count. That's religion. Even church has a system. Church has a system. And, and how many of you know that, that when you've missed church for some time and, and you show up, after a few weeks, oh, how are you, sister? How have you been? 
where you been? Everybody, somebody has this idea that you're now sinner and you, you have fallen off and, and that you, there, you, you understand what I'm saying? The church even has a system. The world has a system. I've got to get mine. I've got to get it. I've got to get it quick. I've got to make it rain. I've got, got to do this for me. I'm all about me. I've got to take care of me. I, I, don't, I, I just care about me. The world has a system. How many of you know that the kingdom of God has a system, though? The kingdom of God, the, the, the system of the kingdom is unlike any other system because it's a royal system. It is a system about freedom. It is a system about honor. It is a system about love. It is a system about you being able to succeed and not just succeed, but have significant impact in this world. The kingdom of God has its own system. Say, there is a better way. There is a better life. Listen, this is the reason why I tell you this, because if you've ever felt trapped, if you've ever felt like you could only go so far, if every day you feel like it's a fight, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you've suffered or had lost relationships, if you're tired of the past holding you back, if your heart has been broken, if your hope has been hopeless, if you feel like you, you can only get to a certain level, if you, if you feel like you're on this wheel that you just keep going around and around and around, if you've ever felt like, you know, I just feel like I just can never be fully joyful, if you've ever been to that place, then I got great news for you. The kingdom of God has a system that is getting ready to get downloaded into your spirit and when the kingdom of God infiltrates your spirit you begin to look at life in an entirely different new way you begin to pray like you've never prayed before you begin to petition heaven the way you're supposed to petition heaven and I'm telling you you know what it doesn't take long it doesn't happen it doesn't happen instantly at times but you know what it's gonna happen the kingdom of God has a better system God is introducing Israel to a brand new system. It's a system that we see he introduced in the book of Genesis. It's the system of sowing and reaping. Look at your neighbor and say, you won't grow it. Look at them. You won't grow it if you don't sow it. Let me give you a brief recap. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5. I spoke this uh, in December, and I gave you a little foundation. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, that now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord had not sent rain on the earth. What has not been sent? Who's holding it back? Did somebody say rain? What hasn't hit the earth? Come on, come on, talk with me. What hasn't hurt, hit the earth? Rain. Who's holding it back? God. Why is God holding that, the rain back? Because there was no one to work the ground. That word work is translated to management. In other words, God is not going to allow progress where there is no management. So who's in charge of the rain? Who's in charge of the earth? Ultimately, God. But if you look further in, this, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says that God has given man dominion, which means that who's in control of seed? Man. Right? We, don't we have farmers? And, and who's in control of those seed? Man. Right? God doesn't scatter the seed. Man does. You understand? So who's in, car who's in control of the rain? Who's in control of the seed? Okay. God is in charge of the growth. Man is in charge of the sowing. So God is, is instituting a brand new blueprint. Actually, it's not even brand new. It's... it's, it's it's something that has already been said. So it's something that's already been established. 
All he's doing is he's giving them a revelation. Many things that we think are new are not new. You're just understanding it for the first time. Revelation. So God is in charge of the growth. Man is in charge of sowing. And and what he's saying in this particular scripture in Leviticus chapter 2, and he's saying, I'm going to give you a new new blueprint. Follow me. Follow my commandments. Follow He's saying, I'm giving you the Sabbath. I'm, I'm, he's laying down so much foundation here. He's saying, if you will sow some obedience, if you will sow following me, if you will sow reverence, if you will sow honor, if you will sow goodness, if you will sow your heart, if you will sow your talents, your time, your energy, your efforts, your treasure, then I will send rain and it will be a rain like you've never seen before and you will see growth take place in your life like you've never seen before. If you sow it, then he'll grow it. This is the principle that God is establishing. He's giving them a brand new blueprint. He's saying, I need, you to, I need you to understand that whatever you sow, you reap. Isn't it true that if I eat in and out every single day of the week, in a month from now, in two months from now, it's going to show on me. Amen? If I go and I spend money frivolously, and, and I do not carry myself with a budget, then it's going to show when I want to go and take something out of that little thing called the ATM. Isn't that true? Whatever we sow, we reap. So God is introducing a new system. He's challenging them. I want you to sow some obedience. I want you to sow following me. I want you to sow honor. I want you to sow reverence. I want you to sow your heart. I want you to sow everything that is about you. Because if you do that, then I'm going to send rain. Come on, say ready for rain. Six truths really quickly about sowing seed. What is seed? What is seed? Some of you are thinking, well, I'm going to go plant some tomatoes, and, and that's great. You know, that's awesome. But, but, but what, what is seed? What is seed? What, 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 is, what, is, what does it look like? If, if, it, if it was something that I could see or something that was tangible, what is seed? Seed is your time, your talents, your energy, your treasure, your resource, your abilities, your skills, your dreams, your work, your efforts, your ideas, your song, Nani, but your, whatever, all of those things are seed. And there's so much more. And all of you have that in your life right now. Whether you can see it or not, whatever you're feeling about your life, whatever, whatever, whatever discouragement, whatever things you're battling with, all of these things reside in your life right now. Say, I have seed. The second thing that I like to say about seed is seed starts out small, but it ends up big. Never, the Bible says, never underestimate small beginnings. Seed starts out small, but it ends up big. If I go and I plant an apple seed, I don't get one apple for that seed. Am I right? I get a tree and a tree that is filled with apples. In other words, when it comes to your seed, when it comes to your time, your talents, your energy, your treasure, your resource, your abilities, all of that is destined for one thing, multiplication. Your life is destined to be multiplied, not addition. If the enemy is all about division, what is God about? Multiplication. And so, you know what? I I despise, I despise small thinking. I, I just, I have a problem with it. It really, really bothers me. Because my God is big. And my God can do something when there is nothing there. We sing about it, Waymaker, right? 
I don't know the rest of the song, so I'm not going to even try. But yet, you get what I'm saying is that God is a way maker. God has the ability. God has the power. God, God knows it all. Before, before was, was, God was. So you understand what I'm saying? God is all powerful, all knowing. He's omnipresent. He is a big God, and he doesn't give small dreams. They may start out small, but they end up big. He doesn't just give you talents just to give you talents. He doesn't just give you abilities just to give you abilities. He doesn't give you a voice. He he doesn't just he doesn't give you the ideas he doesn't just give a dream just because he has the idea and the mark and he has the goal and that is the goal of multiplication so come on somebody say i have seed sowing seed takes work and it requires management it requires that i go and i dig up the ground and i plant something in the ground called a seed and i water the ground and I continue to water the ground. And I continue to water the ground. And I continue to water the ground. Are you getting it? And I continue to water the ground. And pretty soon I start seeing that little shoot come out from the ground and then I got to take care of it. I got to make sure that it has the nutrients. I got to make sure that it's taken care of just like a dream. You've got to take care of it. You've got to water it. You've got to allow God to speak into it. You've got to allow God to progress you through it. You've got to let things die off from you. You've got to let things grow in you. And then what happens is you begin to see God doing something in your life. It requires work and management. Seed requires a certain climate. Seed requires a certain climate. You know that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Seed is dependent on the season. It's dependent on the season. Seasons are dependent on the cycle of the sun around the earth. The closer you are to the sun, S-O-N, the more that you will be in season. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Listen to this. Continual sowing means continual harvest. And if I can have the worship team, I'm ending now. I have a friend of mine. His name's Anthony. And I'm not speaking in the third person. His name's Anthony Perry. How many of you guys uh, know where uh, Fremont is? In Fremont, there's a place called Ardenwood Farms. I think you used to live right there, right, Pastor Kimo? Ardenwood. And... Uh, he, he has, they, they still have the um, only organic farm in the Bay Area, my buddy Anthony Perry. And I was doing work for him one year, um, not on the farm, tech stuff. And um, I noticed that they, 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 they had this, um, they have some crazy vegetables there, things that I've never seen before. They're, they're organic, though. And just, uh, you know, Romanesco and this green cauliflower that looks like it has, like, horns and stuff. It's, it's crazy stuff. It's all organic. It's beautiful. And this one area of field that I had seen just a week before that was filled with all these plants and all this, I, th I believe it was lettuce or some type of lettuce, all this, all this, this greenery that was out in this field was gone. I loved his grandfather. His grandfather was awesome. And the following week when I was there, I saw this grand, his grandfather, and he was plowing the ground. Now, me not being a farmer, I thought, oh, well, you know, it's the, the planting season's over. I thought, they're done. And I talked to Anthony. I said, hey, Anthony, what's your grandfather doing out there? He said, oh, he's planting. I said, yeah, but isn't it getting cold? I mean, aren't we entering into the winter season? Like, isn't it getting like, are, are, you can't grow anything. He goes, oh, no, we always plant. We're always planting. There's some crop that grows in other times of the year than, than others. I said, well, what is he planting right now? And he said, he's planting something called a cover crop. I said, what's a cover crop? He goes, it's just a crop that we plant to be able to prepare for the next season. It keeps the nitrogen 
and it keeps the nutrients into the soil. That's why we don't have to spray. Everything's organic. And so we keep planting. Every single time we pull from a harvest, we end up planting more cover crop. I said, so you mean to tell me, and God started speaking to me with this. So you mean to tell me that you're preparing now for a harvest that's happening next year? And he says, yep, we're preparing now. The ground is being worked on now. And I began to think to myself, wait a minute, what if, what if we're supposed to live life as if I'm not planning for 2020 in 2019? See, many people are trying to live life and they're trying to do certain things and they're trying to see things now. But do you realize that you end up reaping what you sowed last year? Start sowing for 2021 now. It's a whole different ballgame now. whole different system. You see? Listen, listen. We cannot plan a move of God. All you can do is prepare for one. God will always meet you at the level of your preparation. Some of you think faith is doing something real crazy. Sometimes faith just looks like writing something down. Sometimes faith just looks like getting up in the morning and sowing that thing in prayer. Sometimes faith just, just looks like, you know what, I'm just going to worship even though I don't feel like worshiping. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna believe. I'm just gonna speak God's word over my life. I'm gonna speak God's word over my family. I'm gonna speak God's word over my finances, over my health. I'm gonna sow this thing because one day, one day, it's gonna shoot up something incredibly big, and it's gonna be something amazing that I can give to other people. They were always ready for the next harvest. Isn't that what the scripture says? I'll give you my full attention. I'll make you prosper, make you grow in numbers and keep my covenant with you in good working order. And he says this, you'll still be eating from last year's harvest when you have to clean out the barns to make room for new crop. This is the word of God. You can live from harvest to harvest. You can have more than enough. I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about a supernatural resource from heaven. Do you, not, do you understand that the government of God has an entirely different government than the economy of this world? When Joseph lived in Egypt, God raised him to second in command because he had the wisdom of God. And God used him to be a blessing. How? By releasing that wisdom. Multiplied himself. I wonder what would have happened if Joseph would have said, you know what, I don't believe this is going to happen. When his brothers left him in the pit. When he ended up in prison. He didn't understand one day God was going to move him into the palace. That's what sowing does. The Bible says that you reap what you sow. Sow because it's supposed to be multiplied. Sow because your life is supposed to count. Sow because you have something inside you called purpose and potential. Sow because your life really does count. Sow because your song really does count. So, because your work really does count. So, because your effort really does count. So, because your resource really does count. You're getting what I'm saying. Your life is intended to multiply. How many of you have ever been to Hawaii? Hawaii's weather is incredible. 
You want to know what's even more incredible? Is the rain. Which actually has to do with weather. Okay, anyway. It's incredible. It's warm. It's like 85 degrees out, and then the water that comes down from heaven is warm. It makes you just want to do something. It makes you just want to go out in the rain and experience the warmth of the water and the warmth of being outside. This picture came up on Facebook of Leah. And this is when we used to live in Hawaii. And there she is celebrating and enjoying the rain. And she's going crazy. And I just remember her just splashing in these puddles. And, and you know what? Like a good father, I said, yeah, go ahead. Enjoy yourself, babe. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. And she was screaming and she was loud and she was having just this, this total great time in the rain. You know what? The kingdom of God wants to shower over your life so that every single day, every single year, every single opportunity you can have, it looks just like this. It's great to dance in the rain. Come on, stand up with me, folks. <laughs> 